Welcome, everybody, to Episode 7 of Generation Jihad. I'm joined again this week by my comrade-in-arms, Bill Roggio. We are also joined this week by a guest. We promised you we were working on hosting guests on this podcast, and we meant it. It wasn't a lie. We are honored this week to have our longtime friend and colleague, David Gartenstein Ross, join us. As some of you likely know, David is an expert on terrorism and a variety of related issues. He's a prolific author, having written two mass market books. One is a personal memoir titled My Year Inside Radical Islam. And the second book, titled Bin Laden's Legacy, Why We're Still Losing the War on Terror, is a critical look at America's counterterrorism policies. The second book, incidentally, has a very cool cover with, I think it's a $20 bill being burned on the cover, emphasizing how much money America has wasted in fighting terrorism. In any event, uh, he's also the author, co-author, and editor of numerous other books and monographs. And hopefully sometime in the coming months, he and I will have a book out dealing with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and affiliated organizations. That book is going to focus on the jihadist tactics and how they've evolved over time, emphasizing that they're learning organizations. And we may chat a bit about that today. We'll see. Uh, in addition to all of that, and uh, David has a lengthy biography, I'm not going to be able to, to do it all here, he's also a successful entrepreneur. He founded a consulting firm uh, named Valens in 2014, and I think it uh, speaks to, uh, as a good testament to his uh, success that he, we're here in 2020, and even in the middle of the pandemic, it's still going strong. So, David, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I appreciate that introduction, and um, it's such an honor to be your first guest. Uh, congratulations on uh, the success of your podcast, not at all unexpected, obviously. Um, and as um, your listeners should know, I've known you and Bill forever. Um, I was there back before Long War Journal was called Long War Journal, um, admiring right. Bill's work, writing with him. And it's been great to see um, two things about the work you all have done. First, it's been great to see you get more recognition over time. Um, you all do a really valuable service, and sometimes... Uh, you're the only ones out there um, stressing different, really important angles of different aspects of the uh, jihadist universe. Uh, and the second thing is the two of you have always displayed so much integrity, uh, willing to go against the crowd, willing to challenge what other people are saying. So it's great to see both of you with the success that you've achieved. Oh, well, thank you very much for that, David. That's very kind of you. And of course, you've uh, you've stuck out too as well, stuck your neck out as well on, on various issues over time. And so that's uh, part of the reason why we've become such close friends. Um, you know, Bill and I were talking about uh, having you on this week because obviously everybody's in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And we know that you're watching all these jihadi organizations, all these terrorist organizations, not just jihadists, by the way, but other organizations as well. You had a piece out recently about the accelerationist movement, which is one of those things I know very little about, but sounds spooky. Um and, but you're watching how all these groups are reacting to coronavirus, and I was wondering if you, you wanted to share some uh, sort of initial thoughts on what you're seeing. And obviously, this is sort of a broad topic, and there's a lot of different angles to it. But just if there's anything you, you think that listeners should be aware of or sort of your first, general first impressions, we can kick it off that way. Yeah, to take a broad cut, uh, the way I've always approached these actors is to try to think about things, first of all, from their perspective. Uh, in other words, when something big happens— how are they going to be looking at it based on the strategic doctrine that we know that they have and uh, the tactical capabilities that, that they have? And that, I think, is one of the reasons why when you go back about 10 years ago, all of us had an interpretation of the Arab Spring revolutions that was deeply in contrast to where the field was at the time. The field thought that uh, jihadist groups would not just be unable to capitalize, but would actually be actively harmed by those revolutions. And we had a very different idea, in part because we were following what they were saying. In this case, uh, I have a lot of questions about whether these groups will really be able to capitalize on the pandemic. Um, I think there's some evidence that they can. But at the very least right now, where I am is trying to understand how they're looking at this in terms of opportunities and challenges. And the way I break it down for the, the sets of actors you talked about, for Sunni jihadists, for Shia extremists, and then for white supremacist extremists, especially the accelerationist movement, is uh, looking at their narrative opportunities, uh, where we already can see them trying to take advantage, sometimes in self-contradictory ways. Um, secondly, opportunities for attack. Um, third is you know, reduced involvement on the CT front, foreign withdrawals or slower troop deployments. And then finally, the ability, at least on the jihadist side, to try to demonstrate governing capabilities. There's always a lot of interesting aspects at play there because they don't actually have to govern. They just need to do something that's in the gap that the ineffective government leaves behind, and they can comparatively look good. 
But they certainly have opportunities to do that right now. And we've already seen groups like Shabab and ISIS uh, try to play that role of showing that they're there for people when their governments are not. Yeah, I think that's right. We were also seeing the same thing with the Taliban in Afghanistan, right, Bill? You've seen some of that uh, coming out of Afghanistan. We've been documenting all the photo sets coming out of there, how Taliban's trying, the Taliban's trying to present itself as a responsible governance actor in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, one of the— Definitely. The, and, and David, welcome to our show. It, it really is a pleasure to have you. I mean, we, as we said, we've worked together for years. I remember um, giving you gear to get, an, get onto an embed into Iraq or co-writing articles at the Weekly Standard in the early days. It's, uh, it's, oh, it's been a joy and a pleasure working with you. And um, yeah, Tom, as you, you noted, the Taliban, um, it, it's been a significant part of, of their propaganda. I, I, I don't look at the other groups as closely as obviously as I look at the Taliban. And they are really pushing the idea of um, of that they are legitimate government government that is um, able to educate the public on Corona and um, and and fight this virus. There's some photo sets of their doctors of teaching things of that nature. And you know, but one of the one of the interesting things the Taliban has pushed is that the, this virus is part of God's punishment. And David, um, I, I know that other groups out there are doing the same. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, the COVID-19 as God's punishment has been pushed, uh, as you said, by the Taliban. ISIS and al-Qaeda both have the same line. I think you have two different, uh, among the uh, Islamist-oriented extremist groups, you have two different lines of narrative. One of them is the God's punishment narrative, which by far the vast majority of these groups have undertaken. Then the second one is the conspiracy narrative, uh, where they don't quite agree on who the conspiring actor is. And in one case, I found this amusing. Uh, Muqtada al-Sadr actually combined these two narratives in a series of tweets in a way that was completely incoherent. Um, he talked about how you had a U.S. conspiracy at play. Uh, he, was, he was tweeting at Donald Trump and said, you know, we all notice that it's those countries uh, that are most opposed to the U.S. And he was referring to Iran, obviously, and also, I think, North Korea – uh, that are in China that are bearing the brunt of this virus. So he's suggesting it was a, a conspiracy. Then he followed up by saying, and we're all laughing at you because you're falling to this invisible enemy. In other words, a virus that you can't even see with the naked eye. And I was like, I mean, do you even like, do you even read your own tweets, right? You're arguing <laughs> that this is God's punishment, but also that the U.S. caused this as a conspiracy. And not only is it God's punishment, but it's punishing your ally, Iran, but anyway, like nobody's ever accused Muqtada al-Sadr of being the most um, consistent man. But within or these bright, two, two, they, they They call him Mullah Atari for a reason. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah the, interesting side note there. And I, I know that, that one thing we try to avoid here is getting down rabbit holes. But there is an interesting uh, question about Mullah Atari that I, I ran into when doing a deep dive on, on Sadr a few years ago which is, it seems that that also may have been disinformation that he planted. Uh, you know, his ability to, to survive during the Saddam regime was impressive, given all the family members of his who were killed. But at any rate, Mullah Atar Atari or not, um, he isn't the brightest of the Sadr clan. Um, so in, in terms of these two different narratives, there's COVID-19 as God's punishment. And you have a few different strands of argument there. Um, the main one being that this really cuts down all of the enemy's areas of strength. You know, the U.S. economy is battered by uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, this feelings of security that Americans once had, obviously, and, and I think, Tom, you actually pointed this out. I was, I was going through a lot of the media reporting, and I think you pointed out in uh, one of the interviews that you gave that obviously there's a problem with this narrative, which is that it, it's not discriminating on the basis of religion. Then you have the COVID-19 yeah. as a U.S. conspiracy, as a Jewish conspiracy. You have some of the Houthis pushing this forward. Um, for example, um, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, Ibrahim al-Ubaidi in one of his khutbas um, are pushing this conspiracy narrative. It's the minority narrative, but it's also there and it's consistent with some of the discourses that you see both out of the region and also out of militant circles. Yeah, you know, I, I, I always find the logical contradictions and inconsistencies in the, in the enemy messaging to be 
uh, humorous and fascinating. I mean, on the COVID-19, as you point out, they're saying it's a divine test or divine punishment. And there's also this recurring theme, specifically in ISIS propaganda, but also in Al-Qaeda propaganda, that there's this sort of purification that Allah is going through of the Mujahideen's ranks to sort of purify it down to a base that's going to be the acceptable one. Well, by that by that standard, then uh, you know the the, pure, the truly purified elite don't include Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, who was the first caliph of uh, ISIS. Doesn't include Abu Muhammad al Anani, the fire breathing ISIS spokesman. Doesn't include Osama bin Laden, the founder of Al Qaeda. And I got to say personally, I'm hoping for coronavirus to get Ayman al Zawahiri because that would be a, 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 a sort of an, an end for him anyway. Maybe not a fitting end, but it'd be an end anyway. But in any event, the point is that this stuff tends to kill all sorts of guys who are considered the elite of the elite on the jihadi side, and they never seem to notice, let alone deal with the inconsistencies there on their end. The, the question of jihadist consistency is an interesting one, uh, because there, there's an area where they're entirely consistent, uh, where people tend not to think that they are, which is the application of theological doctrine to a situation at hand. And obviously, there, there's some pragmatism built in, but generally, that pragmatism is on areas where there's some sort of justification to act pragmatically. Al Qaeda is a good example of that. Um, in our book, Tom, we go over a lot of areas where they're pragmatic. And in recently reviewing the changes in their far enemy strategy, both the way the far enemy strategy became dominant for a time for the jihadist movement and the way they moved away from it, um, it's clear that the areas where they were shifting their view were strategic areas and not doctrinal areas. But the area where I think they're most inconsistent is the application of this core worldview to the world at hand. Uh, you know, bin Laden would often weigh in on current events in ways that I don't think he cared about at all. He had messages about uh, climate change and uh, you know, different messages um, about the political situation in America. Some of them would remain consistent. It was very clear that he focused on the American economy, and he saw that as... You know, the, the, the weakest area of the U.S. center of gravity. But in other areas, I think that whatever kind of script was put in his hand, he would say, as long as it would adv advance his core agenda. And I think that's what we're seeing with the, the COVID-19, whether it's you know, a U.S. or Jewish conspiracy or God's plan. Um, it just it fits the narrative and they don't really know what to make of it. So we'll see, I think, probably a number of different uh, contradictions emerge from these groups over time, with the one thing that ties all of the contradictions together being that all of them are designed to strengthen these groups' position and to make their ideology seem more attractive. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, you know, this gets to one of my bugaboos recently. There was this essay in The Atlantic by Ben Rhodes, former national uh, deputy national security advisor to President Obama, and he uh, Reiterated, he basically said, "Well, the jihad, you know, President Bush said that Al Qaeda hates us because of democracy and our values, and really they hate us because of our policies." And he he cited his supposed reading of Osama bin Laden's fatwas and justifications for religious violence and other messages as sort of evidence that they hate us because of our policies. And I pointed out on Twitter that you know uh, bin Laden had a conspiratorial view of the world in which the Zionist crusaders were conspiring against all Muslims everywhere, and of course this didn't fit in a lot of cases. He had to basically fudge the facts to fit this conspiratorial worldview. But, you know, in, in the case of Saudi Arabia, for example, which is where he objected to the, and we talk about this in the book, David, in the, in, the, in the case of Saudi Arabia, where he objected to U.S. forces being present, he didn't object to the U.S.-Saudi alliance because it was keeping liberal democracy from coming to Saudi Arabia. He objected to it because he thought the U.S. was propping up a corrupt Saudi regime that was preventing the implementation of Sharia law, his version of draconian Sharia or Islamic law from being implemented in Saudi Arabia. So it's not like, you know, he was objecting to the U.S. standing in the way of democracy or something that we all valued. He was standing in the way of his Taliban-style regime in the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula and his conspiratorial worldview. And I, to me, it just goes to show this sort of we all, all three of us have dealt with enemy messaging through the years. And there's, there's a lot of nuance involved in, mess, in going through it, as, as your summary, uh, I think, emphasized quite well, David. Um, but the point is that people go on, they grasp this stuff, and they just sort of look for whatever point, you know, think that they think is going to verify what they want to say, and then they, they forget all the context. Yeah. You know? So first of all, hi, Ben, because I know you'll listen to this. Um, <laughs> I, read, I read Ben Rhodes' essay as well. And it's actually interesting. We were talking about how uh, jihadists have their core viewpoint, and they'll shape facts to try to... Um, be consistent with that viewpoint. They don't necessarily care about those facts as they, um, they care more about the core ideological worldview. I mean, what Ben Rhodes is writing in The Atlantic is very similar. Um, 
it's it's not consistent uh, ultimately with jihadist writings. Um, it does fit his worldview, uh, and that's a, a tendency that we see among a lot of observers. I think the one thing, especially for a guy who wrote a book called "The World as It Is," yeah, you know, I think what we could hope for is people who will take the world as it is, even if it contradicts their worldview. Which look, all of us have ideologies, all of us have outlooks, and if reality contradicts the way that we are looking at the world. Uh, we have to conform to reality and not get mad at reality when it doesn't conform to us. Yeah, it's called science, you know, scientific method and, and hypothesis testing and updating your, your your views based on the evidence, you know, and that, that seems to be surely lacking in the West these days. Um, it's, certainly, it's certainly entirely lacking for the political realm. Um, I'm going to make one more quick point on on the, the messaging. I think, the you know, look, I, I'm a Taliban propaganda consumer. But the, the beauty of the Taliban is that they give it to you all in English on, on Voice of Jihad. And, and the key with understanding their messaging and knowing what's true and false is look, watch their actions um, and, and their words and where they come together. That's, that's that point where you know where the truth is. It's, it's easy to see. And the issue that David mentioned about the, the Taliban and its, its ideology, that's really important. The Taliban is doing what it's saying. It wants to reestablish the Islamic Emirate. It's fighting to do so. It says it won't negotiate with the Afghan government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You wouldn't have to listen to me tell you this. If you just, went there, if you just read Voice of Jihad on a daily basis, you would see this. It's, it's a lot harder when you have to look in various different languages for various different groups. But I, I'm one of the big consumer of the Taliban propaganda because it's all out there. And they're publishing it in English because they want us to know this. That's the irony in all of this. And yet the Ben Rhodes of the world refuse this. Instead, they try to impress their, their nar- narrative their worldview onto this and they're they're trying to say oh well the taliban will negotiate the taliban will um join an afghan government the taliban will fight al-qaeda and none of those things are true you would know that if you if you actually read and understood the taliban's propaganda yeah i think that's right i mean i, I think it's all speaks to the fact that you have to basically develop a sort of a savvy understanding of what you're reading and consuming we all all three of us have dealt with uh, jihadi propaganda through the years but figuring out what's true or not, testing it by basic logic and comparing it to other facts. That's all sort of a process that I think that uh, some people don't go through. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, go back to how the um, jihadists or other terrorist groups are seeking to exploit the coronavirus, David. Um, I know you, you, you've you talked a little bit about some of the different areas where you think they could um, they could exploit it or may fall, or at least try to exploit it. I know you've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, trying to spring guys from prison, which is one of the longstanding things that they've done. Um, and there's other sort of avenues that they could pursue. Why don't you talk a little bit about that so listeners can get an idea? So I think you've got a lot of good ideas about how they may look to exploit the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I think prison breaks I put first and foremost in terms of actual actions they'll take beyond the realm of narrative. The reason being is um, your listeners probably know, but it's worth reiterating in case they don't. Um, prison breaks were a big part of ISIS's regeneration. You had this breaking the walls campaign in Iraq and in the couple of years leading up to ISIS's you know, meteoric global rise, you had um, numerous prisons broken into by militants uh, with the intent of both freeing extremist prisoners and also freeing some prisoners who might not have been extremists, but where this favor could win them over as foot soldiers to, to at that point, AQI's cause, Al-Qaeda in Iraq's cause. Here you both have an opportunity for prison breaks because uh, of the weakness that will surround prisons. Um, You'll have, uh, you know, some guards might be sick. Uh, You might have sick prisoners. Resources will be diverted away from prisons, which is what happens when you're a struggling country in the midst of a pandemic and also an economic collapse. And not only that, but given the clear danger that COVID-19 will spread through prisons, they can frame this as an act that's humanitarian in nature. It gives them an opportunity to win favor with uh, both prisoners who aren't already extremists and also with others. So that's one thing I'm looking looking at. Um, I'm looking at uh, countries, you know, areas where they might benefit. I saw Bill uh, being quoted that Africa is the key area, which I think is, is... accurate, but I'd also add India to that as well. Uh, you've had a lot of anti-Muslim discrimination 
um, especially because uh, there has been a spread of COVID-19 linked to a uh, missionary group which called Tablighi Jamaat or Jamaat e Tablighi, depending on who you are. Um, but that that group um, has been linked to part of the spread in India, and it's led to much more of a generalized suspicion about Muslims. And generally speaking, um, jihadist groups see it as a good thing for them when you have anti-Muslim sentiment because it gives them something to recruit around. I've been watching attacks, and you know, Africa is a place we could talk about the major militant offensive that we've seen over the course of the past couple of months, um, particularly in Mozambique, with um, both soldiers and uh, also civilians being slaughtered. Uh, Jason Burke had some very good reporting on that in The Guardian, uh, but also Nigeria, uh, with uh, about 50 Nigerian soldiers being killed in an Islamic State West Africa province ambush. Uh, similarly, uh, some offensive in Mali. Now, according to statistics, global terrorist attacks are down. But I, I think that that's a li- probably a little bit artificial because um, the vast majority of the kinds of, of, of modalities of violence that these groups engage in, at least uh, in the Africa theater, outside of countries like, say, Tunisia, which is relatively stable. But in places like Nigeria, places like Mozambique, um, Mali, you'll have much more insurgent modalities of attack rather than terrorist modalities of attack. So it's not clear that militant activities are down on the whole. I'll have to wait until I can see some better statistics on that. Um, but that, that's what I'm looking at. Attacks, attack opportunities, uh, prisons. Um, and it's very clear also from their propaganda. You said their propaganda gives you a good sense of where these guys are looking. It's clear they're also looking at the pandemic as something that will reduce uh, the appetite for deployments and so pull away a lot of the pressure that they're facing in places like Mali, in places like Nigeria, in places like Somalia, where a lot of the the counterterrorism pressure against them isn't local, but rather is outside forces that are trying to tamp down the dangers posed by these militant groups. You know, David, you mentioned uh, the global terrorist attacks, so sort of out uh, terrorist attacks basically outside of the insurgency hotspots, the guerrilla warfare zones. You know, and this is something we've talked about through the years. It's always very difficult to sort of get a good handle on sort of statistics in that regard because there are so many variables that that sort of attack success is dependent upon. You know, that basically there's, you know, they get unlucky, you know, they uh, law enforcement intercedes them, intelligence intercedes them, you have counterterrorism pressure that uh, the coming, you know, in form of drone strikes or other things. And I was interested in the middle of all this, you know, there was this plot that, that the Germans say that they uncovered um, where this group of Tajiks from uh, that were ISIS members were basically plotting against the U.S. Air Force and military personnel in Germany. And they weren't successful. Obviously, they were arrested. Um, the plotting started sometime in 2019, so in early 2019, so it predated the pandemic. Of course, this isn't something that they planned to spring during the middle of the pandemic. But the issue is, that, you know, one of these things could, you know, I, I was thinking about the but for world in which may, maybe this ISIS plot in Germany goes forward and they somehow execute an attack against U.S. military personnel there. And then you could see ISIS saying afterwards there, we, we've, you know, we, we took advantage of the pandemic and the coronavirus, even though it was really dependent upon several different variables. And I think that just speaks to sort of the uncertainty in the analysis of these issues. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. No, I, I agree with that with respect to the plot, that there wouldn't have been them taking advantage. Uh, it would have been uh, in motion before. I think, though, that they would have perceived a particular advantage from being able to carry out that plot uh, once we're in a pandemic world. They understand that there's going to be more pressure budgetarily, and there's going to be more sentiment um, why do we have you know, troops stationed in Germany when we're barely making ends meet, if that, here in the United States? Yep. So that they're keenly aware of that sentiment. So I'd say that, you know, to me, um, and, and you're obviously, you and Bill are keen observers of jihadist strategy. Um, I, they, they tend to think like chess players. I know that, you know, some uh, major jihadist leaders were indeed chess players. Some of them uh, believe that chess is haram. You have a interesting theological debate there. But regardless, they tend to think strategically like chess players, where um, they tr- they tend to prepare multiple moves. Sometimes they're too complex in that regard. Um, I think, for example, 
the uh, collapse of um, Al Qaeda's relationship with you know what was once called Jabhat al Nusra, uh, rebranded several times, was based on them having actually a very clever plan. And you and Ayatob wrote about it at the time, but it was a plan which didn't take into account multiple things, including uh, some of the deficiencies in communication, the fact that there'd be disparate information, so not everybody would understand the various levels of subterfuge that were at play, the possibility for leaders to be in bad health and thus incommunicado, all of those got in the way of their elaborate plan. But leaving aside their failures, I think the area where they have some success is they tend to play on multiple fronts, and all of the fronts are, you know, none of the fronts are exclusive with one another. So the way I typologized it for Tunisia, where I did a lot of work looking at uh, the growth of Al-Qaeda's local branch there, uh, not branded Al-Qaeda, but Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia, which, which both you and Bill did some, some great work on. Um, in, in, in setting that up, you know, it was a group that was focused on Dawa, uh, that is proselytization uh, towards a militant interpretation of Islam. At the same time, they were involved in uh, what I, I termed hispa violence, violence that's uh, designed to uphold the mores of the faith um, and generally focusing inward on the Muslim community rather than focusing outward on foreign targets. And then you had some slippage uh, to uh, what I'd call jihad violence. Uh, the attack on the U.S. Uh, embassy in Tunis is an example of that. Obviously, at the time, there was ambiguity. And uh, you know you took some heat, Tom, for calling that attack out for what it was. But it's very clear now, looking back at it, you know, eight years later, that Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia and Abu Yad al-Tanizi, the leader of that organization, were at the forefront of pushing that, that, that particular attack on the embassy forward, which you know, took the form of a protest, but it was very clearly uh, a jihadist-oriented um, mission to uh, do damage to the embassy. And so you'd have some slippage to that. Assassination of politicians was another one, and attacks in the western part of Tunisia uh, towards the, the Jabal Shambi mountain range. Um, all those were areas where you had a different level of, of violence occurring. Now, ultimately there, they also imperfectly executed their strategy. Uh, part of that, I think, is actually in very interesting ways related to the Al-Qaeda ISIS competition and some more pro-ISIS individuals uh, within the Tunisian jihadist scene pushing violence forward a bit more, more quickly than AST's leadership would have liked. But regardless, they were playing on multiple levels at the same time. And I think that getting back to the, the Germany example, that's an area where they had this in motion. And um, it's not clear to me what uh, the uh, connection was to central leadership, if any. It may have been... Um, the Ger the Germans the Germans say that they were... Well, and again, it's not clear, so you're right. The, yeah. Germans, the Germans say that they uh, there were ties between the cell and ISIS leaders in both Syria and Afghanistan. So that's what the German prosecutors are saying in their charging documents. Right. So so quite possibly virtual plotter related. Right. Exactly. Uh, something you, something we, I was going to get to next, basically, if you and I would talk a little bit about your work and my work on that. But go ahead. Yeah. Can you continue it? Yep. So to, to round it off, it's uh, all, all I'm saying is that um, similar to what we've seen in other theaters. And, you know, ISIS thinks quite a bit less like chess players than Al-Qaeda does, but I think they still have that element. Um, you know, th they had it in motion, and uh, were they able to set it off during the pandemic? I think they could have claimed legitimately that there was an especial reason why that timing was helpful to them. That makes sense. So the two things we're going to follow up here, I think, on this. One is sort of the Al-Qaeda's... Um, Penchant for for basically being uh, using clandestine fronts and Bill, I want you to talk. We'll come to you in a second and talk a little bit about Afghanistan, even though we don't want to belabor the point. But basically, that they adopted this this policy of not standing out in Afghanistan, and it's basically been very effective in convincing everybody they're not there, except for us and them. By the way, uh, which because you can detect that. And then, but uh, but David, you're talking about Ansar al Sharia Tunisia and everything, and it's very interesting, you know. Abu Yad al Tunisi was somebody who had that that Al Qaeda pedigree, and then after the Arab Spring, when he's released out of prison in Tunisia, he sort of all of a sudden people are rebranding him as just a local sort of militant or local yokel. Uh, when he was already a designated terrorist by the UN, there was already a whole dossier on him showing that he personally met with Bin Laden, and of course Mohammed Zahawi, who was his comrade, the leader of Ansar al Sharia Libya, had the same sort of dossier. In fact. 
both of them have now died. And I know there's some in analytical fields, there's some, there's some sort of sneering at the use of eulogies uh, uh, from Al-Qaeda or ISIS to, 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 to sort of go you know, piece together biographical details. But it's interesting, both of these Ansar al-Sharia leaders have now been eulogized by Al-Qaeda senior leadership. Both of them have been eulogized across Al-Qaeda's network. And it just goes to show that sort of after the fact, after they're dead, Al-Qaeda does the hat tip and say, yeah, you were our guys all along. Yeah. And and in that particular case also, they made no secret um, of their very positive view of Al-Qaeda. Uh, yeah. Looking at Ansar al-Sharia's website at the time and their Facebook page, sure. they'd, ha- they'd post bin Laden statements, uh, but their spokesman, like Hassan ben Brick and others, would always insist, well, we just admire them, we, but we are not a part of Al-Qaeda. And, you know, analytically, that was enough at the time for a a lot of observers to say, no, they're not Al-Qaeda. You know, they say they're not Al-Qaeda. You know, there's one uh, major publication uh, in the field uh, where I was um, writing an article on Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia. And the editor actually pushed back on on us even describing them as a Salafi jihadist organization. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, like that, that got in, but it, it took yeah. much more of a fight than I'd anticipated, um, and Jeez. you know, a lot of you know, substantiating it just went, you know, substantiating yeah. that uh, came down to just showing their own propaganda and where they describe themselves as being Salafi jihadist, right. as well as showing the editor that the that his publication had actually described them the same way, but uh, you know, I, I think that a tendency that you're you're putting your finger on. It's what um, I call. It's what I call disconnecting the dots. By the way, this is sort of the the tendency in the field. You know, it's funny. I'll yeah. let you continue, but I'll just interject this one quick point. Um, you know, you see people sometimes say that there's that some people are sort of motivated by their justification to keep the war going, basically to keep you know keep focusing on Al Qaeda and these groups because they need to justify continued military action. I, I actually find the opposite bias is much more prevalent of analysts who basically, because they all they see is U.S. military intervention as the prime thing they want to object to, they sort of cook the books on their analysis to say that these groups aren't Al Qaeda or aren't part of a you know global jihad that threatens Western interests. Now, the interesting thing from my perspective is, and we'll talk maybe we'll talk about this on this one or a future podcast, is I've had conversations where I say, you know, look, half the places. I mean, you you mentioned Mozambique, David. I have no no inclination to send American troops to Mozambique, you know, you know, not no zero, no zero. I mean, I had no inclination to send American troops into West Africa, but you know, I remember debating a, a, a counterterrorism expert, another counterterrorism expert years ago about Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, and I said, you know, there's a wealth of evidence that Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb really is Al Qaeda, and his point was, well, if you say it's Al Qaeda and you mean it's Al Qaeda, then you're gonna have to send two battalions of Marines into Mali or something. I said, well, wait a minute. You know, you can't bifurcate your analysis from what you want to do from the policy. And this is a common flaw we see in the field. And I think some people accuse us of it. And actually, I think they're the ones that are guilty of it because, you know, that they're the ones that have this sort of reflexive idea that basically if you just admit that ISIS is ISIS somewhere or Al Qaeda is Al Qaeda somewhere, that that somehow necessitates some major military intervention. And believe me, Bill and I have spent most of our lives documenting the history of failures in that regard. So it's not exactly like we're pining for more of that. You know, go ahead. No, I, I agree with that entirely. And obviously, we're, we're treading on the field here. And, and one thing I've, um, you know, wisely or not tried to do is to tamp down on the number of open conflicts I have with other analysts. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, our book, Tom, uh, does get into um, some of the debates and failures within the field. And I was surprised in uh, going back over the book, you know, even right now in the midst of a pandemic, when you know I'm working 115 hours or so a week and have, you know, much better things uh, to worry about, than analytic debates of of years ago, yeah. Yeah, it no was surprising kidding. to me just how personal those still felt, like six, seven, eight years later. Um, and actually, I mean, so one thing I'll bet you, you talked about Valens Global at the outset. In part, you know, when I when I think of various you know rivals within the field, um, and you know, we're open about the fact that there are some rivalries here. I, at the at the end of the day, I think I owe them uh, more than anything a debt of gratitude. In the sense that that's why I started Valens, right? I, I realized that there there were a number of areas uh, going back to 2011 through about 2015 or 16 where I knew I was right and ultimately I'd be proven right, but it was professionally harmful to take the positions that I did. You know, the Arab Spring and the impact of the Arab Spring was one. Uh, and then the Al-Qaeda-ISIS competition was another. With a, And I'd say a third 
was connections between uh, Al Qaeda and regional groups, where you all were much more front and center than I was on those debates. Uh, but ultimately, we we came to um, you know similar uh, conclusions on those issues. And I realized that as as an individual, as just an analyst, there was no there was no way to change this dynamic. As an analyst, you could be shut out of everything, no matter how right you are. And the more you kind of bang the table and say, "But I was right," the more you just look like a jerk. Whereas with an organization, I realized well, I could, had the you, oper- could, you could bang the table here, David. That's fine. <laughs> nah, I, I, my, my my table banging days are are behind me. Uh, with an organization, though, I realized what I could do was train a cadre of analysts. And, you know, center the organization, not around my perspective, but around the perspective of actually getting things right. That is being reflective about what our projections are. And over time, if we get our projections wrong, you know, be open about that and understand the reasons they were wrong so that we could adjust our lines of analysis. And so what we're pointing to on the whole is, is I'd say two factors that I'll highlight here that are worth highlighting. One is the field is way too personal. And based around oh, cults totally. of personality, um, and based around patronage networks. But secondly, it's not self-correcting in its errors. What, it's not what scientific, yeah. right? This is my biggest complaint, David: the, the lack of self-correction, the lack of self-reflection yeah. when you're wrong. I, I'd say all of yeah. us are of the view that you actually need competing schools of thought. Sure. Because these are clandestine actors. I mean, I, you don't need stupid schools of thought. You don't need schools of thought that have been proven entirely wrong. Although we do have some of those, just to be clear. Well, no, th- those, are, <laughs> those are clearly there. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I think that in a well-functioning analytic... So go, go for example, back to debates over Ansar al-Sharia Tunisia. It did not offend me that there were people who disconnected sure. the dots. Like, in fact, I think it's good to have skeptical eyes there. Yeah. But it's, it's like the statement... You're welcome to your own opinion or your own conclusions. You're not welcome to your own facts. Um, the problem is when the field isn't self-correcting, it's so personality-based that rather than admitting that they're wrong, you know, analysts will kind of either jump on some new conclusion where they say that people who were right about that last issue are now wrong, or else they'll uh, create these very intricate ways that they happen to be right all along. And that's not healthy. Um, you know, For clandestine actors... You really have to be very honest about where you're getting things wrong. Because, so for example, one thing that I got wrong in the 2014 to 15 period, like I, I actually did, I did a very good job, I would say, of tracing ISIS's trajectory of decline, but my time frame was off. It was off by probably nine to 12 months. And like eventually I realized what the error was, which was that I thought that there would be more coherence in ground forces than there was, uh, that they'd be able to kind of cobble things together, as they eventually did. But it was it was acknowledging, and it was an invisible error, right? It was one I didn't have to admit, and people tend not to admit errors that are invisible. But it was an invisible error, but it was cl- still clearly an error. And understanding why it was being made was really important to correcting and ultimately getting analysis right. And we, that's why I'd, I'd say for good analysts, they need to be able to put their ego aside and it's the process of understanding where where your views are not tracking with what you're seeing that is helpful for you to understand within these clandestine actors, what are the internal dimensions, whether it's leadership coherence or incoherence or personality fr- fractures, um, your personalities butting up against each other. What are those internal factors that I might be missing that cause my projections not to match with what's actually going on that I can see uh, through external sources. Yeah, you know, let me interject two points there. I totally agree with that. The first thing is on Syria, you know, we've, we've covered obviously the evolution of Al-Qaeda there, and that's a total freaking mess. I mean, we've been covering the facts on that, and there's just so many rivalries and problems and management difficulties, and we've covered that. What's interesting is, you know, in July 2016, when Nusra Front rebranded as Jabhat Fat al-Sham, you and I said this was a rebranding move that sort of reverted back to the original strategy for Al-Qaeda in Syria, and, and it turns out it was. There are HTS sources now who say that that was what it was at the time. They're trying to fool the media. There are, there are critics of Al-Qaeda. There are cr- Al-Qaeda critics in Syria of HTS who say that that's what it was at the time, you know. But it was a slippery slope and re- resulted in a series of problems, which we then ended up documenting. And you can go back through our reporting along with journal and your reporting, and you can see that we were doing that. And the point is, is that the story evolves, right? I mean, you have to take into account how the story evolves. And there's too there's too many of what I call sticky sticky estimates, just like sticky prices and economics, where where the assessment 
doesn't reflect shift, uh, you know prices don't reflect changes in supply and demand that's the same thing when it comes to uh and analytical failures, I think, in our field and what's going on. And that's why I want to get to just real quick, because we talk about this in the book to be, but I'll give Bill a chance to chime in here. One of the all time stickiest estimates in the field. And we've talked about this. And I, I don't care. I can't get enough of this because it's just to me, it's it's the it's the best example of this is for years. Right, Bill? For years, the U.S. military generals, the intelligence community kept saying 50 to 100 guys in Afghanistan. And that really, the under, found the Problems underneath that, the epistemological problems underlying that assessment have never been corrected. And we still have a problem as the U.S. is looking to withdraw right now. That assessment, um, you know, has been updated to reflect some basic bare minimum of facts. But nobody has a good handle on what's actually going on in Afghanistan now. And it just shows that these, these failures aren't just personal to the people we know. These are writ large throughout big bureaucracies. Bill, you, you kept like a, a running tally of that for a while, didn't you? We're... <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the... The, it, it, the 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 most humorous and sad at the same time uh, thing about that was the U.S. military's own press releases on its targeting of Al Qaeda disproved what it was saying for 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 years. And then once I started pointing this out around in three years later, they stopped issuing the press releases. So the you know the long the to make a long story short. Uh, Leon Panetta, who was a CIA director at the time in 2010, he said there was 50 to 100 Al Qaeda. This was done to justify peace talks with the Taliban. Um, they kept this estimate up for for five, six, almost six years until the U.S. raided a camp in uh, October 2015 in Shorebach, and they kill or capture between 150 to 200 Al Qaeda. So I guess that number goes to there's now negative 50 to negative 100. Um, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. So the military goes, well, we have to revise that us estimate to upward to 300. And, you know, all the time, Tom and I are documenting this and explaining why this, this, this worldview is wrong. We don't do it. Do I, do I know the number of, of how many Al Qaeda in, in Afghanistan? Absolutely not. But either, I think but the either only one they. that knows yeah, that is Al Qaeda. Either the U.S. military intelligence officials are giving you this number. That's right. The point. They, don't, they don't know either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and so, but the point was, all of the available evidence, at least the available evidence in the public domain that was being given by the military and by intelligence, was that it was clearly more than 50 to 100. And another thing they were stating, too, was Al-Qaeda was confined to two uh, province, Kunar and Nuristan in, in Afghanistan. And again, the military's own press releases were showing raids against Al-Qaeda and raid against Taliban-linked Al-Qaeda commanders throughout all of Afga Afghanistan. So you can't have this breadth and depth of, of Al-Qaeda activity with just 50 to 100 guys who are meaningless. And so, yeah, and has, has anyone ever admitted failure to that? No, they haven't. As a matter of fact, the argument is still being used to this day to say, well, Al-Qaeda is insignificant or, or not even present in Afghanistan, and that's why we should get out. Because the policy of getting out of Afghanistan trumps the actual facts of what Al Qaeda's presence in Afghanistan is and its relationship. Yeah, and to right. be clear, we've you you and I have given up on getting anybody to be accountable or to update their assessments on us. We're just gonna yeah, right. no. yeah. accountability. No, we're we're going to just field? we're just no, we're just going to document so. on the way out what happens. But you know, David, you brought up something else earlier. Oh, go ahead. You had a point on this. Go ahead, David. Yeah. So one thing that that happens frequently is you'll have an analytic assessment that ends up getting circulated, and its very circulation makes it uh, be taken as gospel. And yeah. I suspect that, that what happened with the 50 to 100 is that there was some snippet that actually had that information, but it was a snippet that they shouldn't have been giving so much credence to. So let's say, for example, that the well, actually, law... I know, I, know, I know what the snippet is. Right. Uh, it, it's from the Bin Laden files, and it actually takes it out of context, but go ahead, yeah. If you want to... uh, no, why don't you... Uh, yeah. uh, there, there was basically – well, it actually was totally circular. So what happens is they, they put the assessment out, and then they were uh, – bin Laden's killed in May 2011. And there's one file on which bin Laden says that the Obama administration sent 100,000 troops into Afghanistan for just 50 to 100 al-Qaeda guys. Right. Basically, basically what he was saying was – Look at the massive commitment resources they have for a threat that they think is only fifty to one hundred Al Qaeda guys. It tells you how how willing to your point to be to your book Bin Laden's legacy to how we waste resources. It was basically a version of that argument. 
But Bin Laden was not endorsing the 50 to 100 number. In fact, concurrent with that file, there were other files that showed that, in fact, al-Qaeda's presence in Afghanistan was much larger than that. In fact, there was one battalion in Kunar and Nuristan that had 70 fighters all by itself. And that same, that same file, as we've documented, showed that al-Qaeda's report to Bin Laden was that they had very strong military activity, their quote, across you know several provinces, a number of provinces in Afghanistan. So basically, it's a good example of what you're talking about, David, where people just pick the facts to justify their views. And that's and that became this circular sort of an argument that, that lasted, that, that didn't matter how much other evidence came out, they just held on to that with, for dear life. You know? There also, in some cases, are, um, you know, it's possible that there's another snippet as well, right? So sometimes, uh, what you're pointing to, look, for, sometimes people will have... Um, you know, clearly an ax to grind and it'll be uh, reasons that, you know, ideological reasons they get things wrong. Sometimes it's just not reading contextually and not understanding what's actually going on with the document. Well, that, that's a big, that's so a big like, for, for example, if Long War Journal, if it were a clandestine publication, um, and I, I know this never happens, never happens, but let's say Bill were frustrated with you, Tom. And, you know, Bill said, you know, what does Tom contribute? He's only ever written three articles Right, like that's not literally true, right? Like you have in fact written many more articles for Long War Journal than three. But if someone couldn't see Long War Journal, uh, they might say, "Oh, Tom Jocelyn, insignificant contributor, only wrote three articles based on a statement that was met with hyperbole." Um, and there are sometimes cases, um, from what I can see, where hyperbole or overstatement is taken literally. And there are some places, you know, within uh, the intelligence community, there are some uh, arms that are better than others at uh, looking back at analysis and challenging it. There, there are some, uh, National Counterterrorism Center is this way, where lines of analysis that are embedded and dominant, um, you know, there is a real hesitancy to challenge them. And so um, subsequent analytic products will tend to conform with earlier analytic products because overturning a line of analysis is a big deal. Uh, so sometimes that's what happens, and it's it's co completely apart from ideology. You just, it's sort of the garbage in, garbage out effect. And for 50 to 100, I, like my suspicion is certainly some people subscribe to it for ideological reasons, but I think also you know at the core of that is probably garbage that got into the system that then gained power through the pure yes. power of recirculation. And that, that speaks to sort of cognitive biases in humanity. I mean, there are all sorts of problems with, uh, you know, how we perceive things. We all uh, suffer from these. But, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, we were talking about, you know, in, in our book, we talk about the Bin Laden files somewhat. Um, I've gotten sidetracked because, uh, you know, we, we got the file. The CIA released the files, or most of them, almost all of them in 2017 as a product of our efforts, our collective efforts. Um, they sort of made them a jumbled mess to go through. Thank you, CIA, for that. Um, you know, I've wasted countless hours on this. Uh, we would have more documents if they were put out in a more systematic fashion, you know, to put in the book. We put quite a few in the book. But it's interesting, you know, taking con uh, documents out of context to be what you talked about. That's exactly what happened with Shabab. You know, Shabab, the, the, the files are very clear that bin Laden says, you know, He's, he's, he, he actually admits at one point, he, he says to T. Abdul Rahman is giving him memos back and forth. And he's also corresponding with Goldene, who was the head of Shabab at the time in Somalia. And he, he clearly, you know, Bill reports in August 2010 that the U.S. military basically has detected that Bin Laden told Shabab to keep their ties to Al-Qaeda, their, their actual allegiance to Al-Qaeda on the down low. Don't make it public. And it turns out that's exactly what the files say. But there were people who cherry picked the files to say, no, no, he denied this merger with Shabab when actually that's not the case. And in fact, we go back through this and I don't want to belabor the point. We'll, we'll come back to this at some other point. But, you know, it's interesting in May 2011, this small set of files were released through the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. It was just 17 files, I think. One of them was a letter from bin Laden to Golanay of Shabab saying, keep your allegiance to Al Qaeda on the down low. He didn't deny the allegiance. He just said, keep it on the down low. But it's interesting, that file, we subsequently learned, was actually an attachment to a longer file that wasn't released at the time. And in that, that longer file, he actually, Bin Laden actually tells the T. Abdul Rahman, here's what the buyout or the oath of allegiance from Shabab and Somalia should say. Here's what they should say to us. But we're going to keep it private. We're not going to make it public for all these various tactical and strategic reasons. But that sort of history is still mangled out there. I still see people say, yeah. in fact, I, I got a, I got accosted by an analyst who I won't name just last year, right? Bill, who was telling me, no, you're you're totally yeah, you're totally stunning. wrong. Shabab, you know, Bin Laden denied Shabab's admittance into Al Qaeda. I'm like, I have the files. I have literally where he says, this is the buyout. This is the oath of allegiance. You know, you, you can't tell me that anymore. You know, 
Um, in any event, Shabab is quite open about that now. But that speaks to your point. And, you know, I remember something you said about the Bin Laden files back then, Davi, which was so right. And it, your words stand out to me. That when those files were initially released, and this goes to the contextual analysis that needs to be done, there wasn't a, a total clear chain of letters released. Like there wasn't a complete correspondence released in a, at any event. You have to look through all the correspondence, the back and forth, to get a sense of the whole story. And that's one of the analytical flaws we've encountered here numerous times. Yeah. So to flip this around and uh, move it from uh, a, a little bit of negativity uh, to something positive, I, yeah. I'd like to I'd like to take this and provide some uh, advice to young analysts because I think that, like to me, um, you know, all of us came up around the same time, and people who took the time to try to make me better, you know, I, I really appreciated uh, throughout the the course of my career. So I think there, there are three things I would draw in terms of, we've talked about a lot of errors the field has, has made. And, and I know all of us are dedicated to making this field better. So for young analysts who want to come in and not repeat the kind of errors that we've seen over the course of the past couple of decades, you know, the first one I would say is work from primary sources, know your primary Absolute, sources. Absolutely. The secondary literature is often wrong. And I think that probably the analyst who accosted you, uh, I mean, I don't know who it was, but my guess is it's someone who was very familiar with the secondary literature and had not engaged in the primary literature. And Actually, so, he, cl- he claimed to have uh, worked on the primary literature, which made it worse. But Woof. <laughs> yeah. At any rate. Worse. <laughs> yeah. Leave, leave him aside. But I, I can yeah. see, like, I'll talk to analysts uh, sometimes frequently where it's very clear that they're deep in the secondary literature and yeah. have no cognizance to the primary literature. And so there are areas, like strange areas, where the secondary literature is completely wrong, but it takes on special power through force of repetition. Uh, It's similar to circular reporting in newspapers. You sometimes have circular analysis. One point that just got repeated um, ad infinitum back in uh, 20, uh, I think it was 2011, um, was the notion that Hassan Dahir Awais was on the verge of splitting with Shabab. Yep. Uh, and it came from a single sermon that he'd given. And I remember there were six... I was doing this piece on Shabab, which I ultimately never published. But there were s- six different secondary sources which all talked about how Awais was on the outs with Shabab. Then he got caught by Somali authorities. He had every reason to defect and didn't do so. And, you know, the the problem... you know, when I got, When I stopped reading the secondary and looked at the primary literature, I realized there was a lot more that Awais had said. And this was critical of Shabab. It was critical of their strategy, but it was in the context of many more sermons, which portrayed a much more complex picture. So number one, read your primary sources and you know, assume that the secondary literature is unproven until you've gotten to dig in and look at the primary sources yourself. Second thing is ignore personalities. Uh, there are too many personality conflicts. And I think what, what people don't understand... Like, and be wary I, of Twitter. Be wary of Twitter in that regard. <laughs> yeah, Twitter it's is the same thing. It's, it's been it's Twitter's a poison. Well, it, it absolutely is. And Twitter um, will tend to uh, accentuate the the negative um, aspects of of personality, of solidifying clicks and solidifying in groups and out groups. Um, by the way, by the way, my profile since I joined Twitter in April 2014 when I first started tweeting. tweeting yeah, that's good. Anyway, my profile reads, not a fan of self-licking ice cream cones, clicks, or corruption. So when I got on Twitter in April 2014, I knew the cesspool I was stepping into. Sorry, I didn't mean to keep going, David. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, Twitter is a great example of this. But I'd say ignore personalities and understand that what most people are missing, just as analytic matters, there are, there are personality matters. But as an analytic matter, if someone is challenging you, is challenging you uh, and not doing so in a disrespectful way, not penning like the takedown type piece, they're actually trying to make you better. Um, I think that, that, that fundamentally challenges to the way we understand the world should be understood if they're not rude as attempts to make us better or make us more rigorous. Make, so make ignore the, personalities. Make the, make, make the truth come out. You know, that's the whole point of it. It's supposed to process to getting at the truth because none of us are, are sole owners of the truth. So Absolutely. And, and number three, I'd say, is it's always the most prominent uh pieces of analysis that should be challenged the most. One thing that that definitively shaped the way that we viewed those initial 17 documents and had an outsized impact in shaping the way they're still understood today 
is uh, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point's uh, Letters from Abbottabad. And, you know, uh, uh, um, so, so, some of the, Don Rassler, who is a co-author, I'm, I'm very good friends with, I think very highly of him. Um, you know, CTC um, uh, has done uh, a lot of things that I'm very thankful to them for, including, uh, you know, allowing uh, us to um, host some of uh, their fellows at Valens uh, during the summer. Um, but, you know, I was, I was critical of that report at the time, not out of any vitriol towards CTC, no. but because given its prominence, no. you know, you have to question you have to, to raise questions. It's, a, right. it's my attempt to try to make CTC better, not to cut them down. Well, so you know, mean- just, to, just to interject one quick yeah. thing on that. So we, we, of course, objected to that report when it came out, too, because uh, we, we knew that there were many, 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 many more files that hadn't been released. So you couldn't just release 17 and say, here it is, ta-da. Uh, but second of all, um, and the, the author sets, to, to be fair, had some caveats in that regard, but then the analysis didn't really follow the caveats. But in any event, uh, the, the, actually, the analog line didn't follow from the documents that were released. In other words, the, the d- details in the 17 documents often contradicted the analytic line taken. Um, and second of all, there was a wealth of, or third of all, there was a wealth of evidence that showed there was contradictory evidence that there were all the sorts of things that we knew were not were not true. There was stuff that wasn't in in those files that we know happened from other sources that we're sort of not putting into it. And just to add sort of to your list there to be, which was excellent for young analysts, you know, one of the biases we come up across is that you know in the intelligence community in particular, there's this, this sort of this idea that if something's classified or comes from super secret sources that it's somehow better or inherently more valuable than something that comes from open sources. And that's probably not true. I mean, over time, if you look at the, how much money is spent on media, social media now, websites, the proliferation of information, you know, most of the information you need now is out there. It doesn't mean that some sources, some super secret sources aren't going to be better. Some of them are going to be. Some of them are going to give you secret secrets that you wouldn't know otherwise. But the vast majority of what you need to know is out there. You need to take a composite or mosaic look at everything and try and figure out the big picture from all the stuff. And don't let you sort of miss the forest for the trees, as so many people do, I think, sometimes and stuff. And, you know, I know from our sources, I know there's a lot of people in the intelligence community who listen to this podcast and, and law enforcement and others and also some baddies. Um, you know, I know I've heard this uh, throughout throughout the years that there's this sort of um, privilege that's given to classified sources at the expense of other sources when sometimes the truth is just sitting right in front of you. I think that's good. If I could add one yeah, more, you know, and again, I, I, I know I said this earlier, but you got to match with what you're reading, you know, statements with what's actually happening on the ground. And I think people just don't do this enough. You're not looking at the full picture. Um, like, you know, like as you guys discussed, one statement from a waste out of context doesn't make sense. But look at how Hassan Tahir Oase operated within the Islamic courts and then Shabab. And you got to look at the full body of work to have a, to have a clear understanding of what's happening. It's it's just not done enough. One statement here, one statement there, and people will draw conclusions based on that. It's just it's shoddy analysis. So I'd add two final things to to round out our to make them seven even points for young analysts. I'll, I'll repeat <laughs> them just so everyone has the list. But um, the sixth thing I would say is measurability. Make your anticipatory analysis measurable so you can see if you're getting things wrong. Uh, that allows you to, uh, as Tom said, uh, utilize the scientific method uh, as opposed to have uh, having projections where you can kind of fudge them a bit to make yourself seem like you have a better record than you do. You want to know when you're getting things wrong. And the seventh thing, Tom, you talked about a mosaic view. I would um, add to that that you should try to have a mosaic view as an individual. Uh, there are areas where I've seen analysts get things wrong because they think they have a composite mosaic view. They're, they're like, well, I'm looking at this slice of the pie, and this guy's right. looking at this slice. But the problem is that sometimes, like, you know all the kunyas that are in documents. Sometimes sure. if you only have a slice and you're not trying to get a large mosaic view, you might miss what's right in front of you yep. because you don't understand the code that's being used. So, I, And nobody can understand the entire universe of information. Nope, but like, the more you understand the more likely you are to make associations that other people are missing when they have a far smaller slice of the pie. So to, to kind of round out the list and just and uh, give it to you all, all, all at once, it's primary sources, number one. Secondly, ignore personalities. Third, uh, the strongest voices are most deserving of challenge. Fourth, uh, as Tom said, the value of open source information. You shouldn't privilege something just because it's classified. Fifth, as Bill said, match what you're reading with what you're seeing on the ground. Sixth, make it measurable. And seventh, try to have as broad a mosaic as you can. 
I think that's great. That's an ex. Uh, it's a really that's a, comprehensive. That's excellent. List. That was, by the way, it. folks. That was pretty much on the fly. I'm watching David through our Zoom here during the pandemic, and he's taking notes and actually <laughs> compiling as we go. Right. That shows far more patience and competency than I have. Uh, so thank you for that, David. I appreciate that. That's very succinct. Uh, you know, I think you know maybe one more topic, and then we can wrap it up for this week. I think you know one of the interesting things we talked about, and let's not dwell on the past analyses so much in this this one, but, but maybe look ahead a little bit. Um, one of the big analytic lines was that sort of ISIS had overtaken Al Qaeda, um, or was going to overtake Al Qaeda in the 2014 to 2015 period. And of course, this all has to do with your def- how you define Al Qaeda, and all these epistemological problems that go into defining Al Qaeda sort of are reflected in that assessment. Um, because now we're standing here, and I think it's interesting. You look at sort of the mo- this monitoring team for the UN, which I read all the reports that come out for the sanctions, uh, you know, initiative on Al Qaeda and ISIS. They come out with the regular reports, and I agree with their analytic line that in many areas today, Al Qaeda is actually stronger than ISIS. You know, they're stronger in Yemen, they're stronger in Somalia, they're probably stronger in West Africa, although ISIS is is pretty significant there. Um, you know, I think if you get the assessment right, they're stronger in Afghanistan. Al Qaeda is, if you actually understand Al Qaeda works in Afghanistan. We're not going to get into this again, but. Many people don't, and uh, there are different other different areas where they are. Of course, not in Iraq, where ISIS is stronger. In Syria, it's sort of uh, debatable, I guess, in terms of depending on a number of different things. But the bottom line is that ISIS didn't didn't deliver the knockout punch to Al Qaeda that, uh, that was sort of predicted. Um, you know, going forward, David, I don't know if you have any thoughts you want to share. Just sort of going forward, what you think about what Al Qaeda is going to do going forward. And I, you, you, you very usefully, and this is something Bill and I do too as well, you split it up earlier in our conversation the modalities between sort of international terrorist attacks and then sort of the guerrilla war fighting. And of course, a lot of what we talk about is Al Qaeda's guerrilla war fighting base has expanded tremendously since 9-11. Um, we think that that ultimately could op- open up opportunities for them in the future. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of variables in play there to, uh, in terms of attacking the West. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, David, you want to share with uh, listeners. Yeah, looking backward, um, I think one of the problems also in the debate about whether ISIS had overtaken Al Qaeda is you have to define in what in what way they'd right. overtaken. Um, I, I think it's very clear that in 2014 through 20, you know, probably through today, if you look at who is the greater international terrorist threat, no question, it's ISIS. Um, not necessarily in terms of dormant capabilities, but in terms of if there's an attack that kills a couple hundred or three hundred people, far and away, it's more likely to be. Um, if it's a terrorist attack as opposed to an insurgent attack, it's far more likely to be yeah. ISIS. Right right now, certainly in recent years, they've committed far more of those types of yeah. attacks, inspired, directed, guided, yeah, sure, in and, recent and that, years, yeah. That could change. I mean, uh, as Which, by know, the way, contradicts the earlier analytic line was that ISIS was just interested in the near enemy and just in, in, in war fighting <laughs> <laughs> inside these Iraq and elsewhere and building the caliphate. Now, of well, course, it's funny right. how, that, how that worked. You know, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Both of those analytic lines were, were wrong. You had two right. different lines at the time. One was that... ISIS was only interested in the near enemy, which some people uh, adopted. The second was that Al Qaeda was only interested in the far enemy, right? Yeah, which was completely yeah. wrong at the time. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's clear that right now Al Qaeda is very near enemy focused, and the reason why is clear. Um, the decision to focus on the far enemy was based on the idea that the U.S. or European powers would always come in to prop up local regimes, as was the case in the Algerian civil war of the 1990s, as was the case with Hosni Mubarak's Egypt. It's very clear that there are many more opportunities in the region now than there ever have been. And so what you've pointed to is that Al-Qaeda has become, and was five years ago, was eight years ago, um, a very capable um, insurgent fighting force. And I think that they're clearly moving in slow motion uh, towards um, something resembling, resembling a caliphate. They've had multiple emirate projects you know, one is in Yemen with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, one is in uh, Somalia with Shabab. Um, you have one in Mali, which you know, I, I wouldn't say they have a nascent emirate there right now, but they had one back in 2012 to 13. And, that, and that's the goal. They're, that's what they're fighting for. Yeah, yeah they're, they're fighting to regain that. So. To me, that, that that that's what I'm looking at with respect to Al Qaeda. With ISIS, and, and, and by the way, in Afghanistan, they they've got that's Afghanistan, this this, this yeah, is the place where they're it, closest, but... where the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan rises again, and this is where the State Department had to come in and lie on the Taliban's behalf to say, no, no, don't worry about it. The Taliban's now going to be good boys when it comes to Al Qaeda and not let them attack abroad. But Al Qaeda is heavily invested in resurrecting the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, and the U.S. never really understood that. And that that, as Ayman Al Zawahiri has said, is in their imagined caliphate, and it is imagined at this point. Um, 
that is going to be, that's what they consider the, the centerpiece of their imagined caliphate. But go ahead, Davina. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, man, I think the only other thing I would add is that for ISIS, I think Southeast Asia is increasingly an area of strength for ISIS. Um, you know, that's th- true. That, it's quite, I, I think that you, if you look at where their center of gravity is, part of it is in Syria as they're coming back as an insurgent organization. Part Iraq. of it, as you said, Tom, is in West Africa. Yeah, sorry, sorry Syria, Iraq, um, you know, which I think... It's fair to still think of them as as an interconnected theater. Yes, definitely, I concur. One of them, one is in West Africa, where, as you said, Tom, you know, they've uh, gained significant strength in that theater, um, and then I'd say uh, Southeast Asia is probably the other major center of gravity. Uh, North Africa, they have potential there, but right now, Akim is just you know is by far the dominant force in North Africa, but. Um, I would definitely rank Al Qaeda today as if you look at the range of capabilities, I would rank Al Qaeda as as being stronger. And actually, like to me, they fairly consistently were the stronger organization, with the bit the big exception that they never held ground like ISIS's caliphate from twenty fourteen through say twenty seventeen. But also at the time, and we wrote about that, Tom. Uh, like, it was made. very, very yeah. foresee- foreseeable that yeah. they surged resources into that, and they weren't going to be able to maintain it. And yeah. once they lost it, you know, they, they still have survived as a major global terrorist militant organization, sure. and that's an impressive thing to be able to do. But if you compare the two organizations, resources, ability to fight insurgencies, you know, the infrastructure that they have, um, on every metric except for terrorist attacks— I think Al Qaeda is today the stronger organization. Yeah, and I I would just add one. I think that's right. I would add one one note on that. Um, what's interesting is on the international terrorist attacks, as we all know, and all three of us have documented this. There was actually a conscious decision by Al Qaeda not to launch attacks in the West, and we don't really know what their capacity is to this day for doing that. You see various official assessments come out of the U.S. from time to time, and the U.N. and others saying that there is a capacity there. Uh, they haven't moved forward with anything big in a while. Uh, it doesn't mean that they will. It doesn't mean we want to overestimate the threat or say, you know, this is something that's coming any any second. But by the same token, it's something that still lurks out there, and I wouldn't be surprised if they try something bigger in the future. I mean, obviously, they've had sort of more targeted operations like the Charlie Hebdo attack in January 2015 in Paris, which was meant to send this religious message and wasn't about— I always compare that to what happened with ISIS in November 2015 when ISIS goes on the rampage throughout Paris— I think that shows you the different thought systems that were in play there in the jihadi world where you had this very targeted attack on Charlie Hebdo meant to send a message to the Muslim masses saying we're here to avenge the prophet because he's been slandered, supposedly slandered by this magazine versus the rampage by ISIS, you know, months later in the same year across Paris where they just went after all these tourist sites and civilian sites and basically said we're going to hold Paris hostage. Two different types of attacks entirely, of course. Um, But yeah, but in any event, I I agree that I think Al Qaeda has been underestimated drastically as a global organization that goes back to all goes back to why we fought to get the bin laden files released in the first place right we wanted to show we wanted to see what this organization actually looks like i don't know you have it go ahead and one what yeah one quick point i mean you know look the the split the al-qaeda versus islamic state split certainly hurt al-qaeda in the sense that it lost its narrative uh for the global jihad as being one central organization but one thing it has done for al-qaeda is allow the islamic state to be a lightning rod basically everyone looks at it allows the al qaeda to sort of operate in the shadows in a lot of places i see this a lot in reporting and an analysis where they're talking about well west what's happening in west africa and the entire rep- report focuses on the islamic state's act- activities and yet fails to mention al qaeda's activities and i see this i get a lot of questions on afghanistan and almost they're almost all focused on the terrorist threat from the islamic state no mention of al-Qaeda. I see this with, um, in, even sometimes even in Somalia when the Islamic State had a stronger presence. So that in a way has allowed al-Qaeda to operate in the shadows, to, to do its insurgency operations, um, allow the U.S. and other, uh, France and other actors to focus their efforts, counterterrorism ac- efforts on the Islamic State and, uh, you know, and allow, again, al-Qaeda to, to do things uh, a little lo- more unfettered. Than they would have in the past. It's a you know marginal, but uh, but it's you know it's not it's not all uh, all negative for for Al Qaeda. I mean, certainly they would love to. I'm sure would love to get the the get the band back together and have everyone under one umbrella. 
but that's not the does I don't think that's going to happen. It's been what six years since the split plus, and um, you know I think the two you know while they share the same goals, the, you know to establish a caliphate and impose Sharia, they have very very different. Uh, worldviews and how they want to approach that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another whole other big topic to open up some other time. Maybe, maybe we'll have to be back on for that. To be, do you have any, you have any uh, parting yeah. thoughts here for our listeners? Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for a, a great wide-ranging conversation. Uh, we started out by talking about the pandemic, and my, my parting thoughts would be that all of the trends that we talked about, you know, Al-Qaeda's ability to gather across multiple regions, its ability to execute a strategy of not standing out, its ability to not have resources devoted to it while ISIS serves as the boogeyman, I believe all of that is going to be accelerated by the pandemic because resources uh, that uh, can be used to undertake counterterrorism missions abroad uh, are going to diminish. Um, If you look at it now, without getting into whether that's a good thing or a bad thing from a policy perspective, I think that it's inevitable. It's going to happen. And uh, it's likely that there will be a focus on the most obvious, loudest targets, e.g. ISIS. Um, I think if you're looking at this from al-Qaeda's perspective, they perceive opportunity uh, because it's going to accelerate a strategy they'd already put in play of uh, flying below the CT radar and being able to gather strength in a relatively low-key way with longer term objectives rather than surging things for the short term. So that tying our past 20 minutes discussion back into the the major topic, uh, I think that the pandemic changes a lot of things, but primarily it accelerates some of those pre-existing trends that intersect with Al-Qaeda's strategic outlook. I think that's a great summary. I think we'll wrap it up there this week. I want to thank you, David, uh, our guest, special guest this week, David Garden Ross, our first guest ever on Generation Jihad. Uh, well, I think we couldn't have picked a better guest to come on and talk about these issues. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, David. It was a pleasure to have you on. It's great to see and hear you and uh, discuss these very important issues. Thanks, gentlemen. Such a great conversation. And you know, congratulations again on everything that you've achieved. This podcast is a real contribution, and it's uh, absolutely an honor to be a part. And we want to thank you listeners again for tuning in this week to this episode of Generation Jihad. This is episode 7. We're going to keep them coming. Uh, Please do subscribe to the show. As a reminder, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your shows. We will see you next week.